Happy New Year! I've just got a simple little Sims build and chat video for you today, so if you want to hang out with me while I build this mobile home park, that's cool. And if not, that's cool too, and I wish you all the best in 2024. So let's get into it. First up, you might be thinking, why am I doing this in The Sims 3 when The Sims 4 for Rent just came out, and I could finally do a multi-family lot like this in 4 now? Well, number one, I don't have it. Obviously, I'm not the biggest fan of EA's current quantity over quality approach to The Sims, of breaking all the elements of gameplay into a thousand pieces so they can pump out a shiny new pack as often as possible to maintain interest, rather than building a game people naturally want to return to year over year based on its own merits. That being said, I'm not immune to that approach either, I have experienced that glow of fulfillment from a frivolous purchase before, and I know it's a nice feeling, but I do find that it typically dissipates within 24 hours, and although EA takes a fast fashion approach to The Sims 4, the prices of these packs are not exactly Shein prices, so I really just can't justify the cost at the moment. And then second, if your YouTube algorithm pushes you Sims content, as mine does, I'm sure you've noticed that there's just an avalanche of videos about new Sims packs every time one comes out, or is even just announced, so anything I could say about For Rent has already been covered by folks that know a heck of a lot more about The Sims 4 than I do, so there isn't much I could contribute on the review or news front, even if I got the pack. But anyway, the reason why I have mobile home parks on the mind actually has nothing to do with the new expansion pack, I've just been on my bullshit again. If you're familiar with my earliest videos, you know I have a problem. Not that, or that. This. The self-proclaimed, most visited real estate website in the United States, Zillow. I'd been staying away for a while and avoiding thoughts of home ownership because, you know, fixating on things you want but cannot have is not exactly the greatest choice for your mental health, but lately, that quiet yet ever-present simmering rage over the fact that most of my money goes toward financing my landlord's backup Audi rather than saving for my own home has been at more of a boil. There's probably a lot of contributing factors to that escalation, and I'm sure those of you who are also renters can fill in the blanks, but I was also just freshly reminded of the ridiculousness of our current housing system because I finally got around to reading Evicted by Matthew Desmond, which came out way back in spring of 2016 and has basically been on my to-read list since then, but it's a long list and reading is hard, so here we are seven years later. But anyway, the book follows several families in Milwaukee who are directly impacted by or living under constant threat of eviction primarily due to the ever-increasing rent charged by landlords. It's a good read, I think some of the policy suggestions at the end could be more ambitious, but it does do a great job at highlighting all of the ways in which our housing system in the US continually funnels the incomes of the poor, as well as taxpayer dollars for things like SSI and government housing supports, right into the pockets of landowners. Now, I'm lucky enough to not be in the incredibly vulnerable position that the families in the book are in. I can afford both groceries and rent every month, but reading it definitely turned up the volume on my desperation to escape the trap of rent, and I did fall back into the Zillow hole for a minute. Which brings us to mobile home parks. So I live in California, and you might be thinking, well duh, that's your first mistake if you want affordable housing. And yeah, fair point. But both my partner and I grew up here, and our families are here, so while we will likely get priced out eventually, it is home for the time being. If I go on Zillow in my general area and put in a price, I think we could reasonably come up with a down payment on in the next few years and exclude condos and empty land. A lot of the results are mobile homes, or more specifically, manufactured homes located in parks where the residents can own the home but have to lease the land underneath it. More on that in a minute. But a lot of these would be a nice step up from my current apartment. A uh, double wide has more square footage, and some even have two bathrooms and a little bit of dirt to plant things in outside. And then there's the big draw in unit laundry, or at least washer dryer hookups. There's also the possibility of equity, meaning my monthly payments would be going in part toward a loan on something that I would own rather than paying off a landlord's mortgage on an apartment building I have no stake in. But equity can be a bit of a red herring in the case of mobile homes because they can depreciate unlike land, which always grows in value. All that to say, I have been perusing the mobile homes in my area lately, which is something I used to do with a little more serious intent a few years back before I was aware of all the potential downsides to mobile home ownership, uh, which are laid out in this episode of Last Week Tonight from April 2019. In case you haven't seen it, I'll summarize briefly, and I'm also including a link in the description to this 2019 report by the Private Equity Stakeholder Project, Manufactured Housing Action, and the Americans for Financial Reform Education Fund. This report is referenced on that show and goes into these issues a little deeper, and I'll pull from a couple other places as well. So as I mentioned, in many cases, the only thing you own with a mobile home is the structure itself, and you have to pay monthly rent for the lot that it's placed on. The term mobile home is a bit of a misnomer, as often their mobility effectively ends after their initial trip from factory to mobile home park. As the 2019 report states, For most residents, it is nearly impossible to move their homes, the structures cannot withstand the move, the costs of moving them are unaffordable, and finding a new spot is untenable. 
when community owners raise the lot rents, residents are trapped, choosing between paying rent and abandoning their home. So while mobile homeowners are not at all alone in falling prey to the harms of financialization of housing, you know, it's why rents are unaffordable for apartments as well, unlike apartment tenants, they are financially tied to a physical structure. So when private equity and real estate firms move in and purchase mobile home parks, a practice that has become common, as highlighted in the report, they have all the more latitude to push lot rents to the highest amounts that they can possibly squeeze out of people. And lastly, when it comes to purchasing a mobile home, most cannot be financed through a traditional mortgage, as outlined in this Atlantic article about the 2017 book by Catherine McTavish and Sonia Salomon titled Single Wide, Chasing the American Dream in a Rural Trailer Park. The article states, Buying a mobile home often means taking on a loan that's similar to an auto loan, as mobile homes are generally classified as chattel, personal property, as opposed to real estate. McTavish and Salomon found that people were paying exorbitant interest rates, sometimes 13.5% or more, for property that, like a vehicle, loses as much as half its value in three years. On that last bit about depreciation, I have seen differing information. I think it largely depends on what's going on with the overall housing market in your area. But either way, you're certainly not guaranteed an increase in value or even for the value to stay the same. So if you do have to sell your home, it could possibly be at a significant loss. So as this 2004 HUD report states, if you don't own the lot, a manufactured home shouldn't be seen as an investment vehicle, like if you're trying to eventually sell and move to a different home. But to the extent that they provide lower rent, they can reduce your rent burden, allowing you to save more which is what I would be looking for, but of course, this report being from 2004 precedes a lot of that pesky private equity investment that, in many cases, has eliminated that possibility. And one last note on financing, the life of a chattel loan is typically a little bit shorter than a mortgage. The upper end of the lifespan for mortgages would be 30 years. For chattel loans, again I saw differing figures, but the longest terms seem to be between 20 and 25 years. So with that in mind, let's take a look at what one of these homes might actually cost me in real life. Here we have a lovely three-bed, two-bath home in San Pablo, which is a bit north of me. It's a little over 1,200 square feet, pretty big. The date it was built is not listed, but looks like maybe 90s or 2000s. And it's got a laundry room, we love to see it. It's listed at $179,000, and the Zillow monthly payment estimate is only $932, which would be amazing. That's less than half of what my partner and I currently pay for a two-bed, one-bath apartment at $2,200 but it looks like that payment is based on the assumption of a 30-year fixed rate mortgage with a 20% down payment. The down payment piece is fine, but we know that this home likely wouldn't be eligible for a mortgage, so let's figure out what that monthly loan payment would actually be. Here I have my little mortgage calculator, um, in case you want to build one of these yourself. I'll link the video that I followed for mine in the description, but I'm just going to make a copy of this mortgage tab and set the parameters for a personal property loan. We'll put in our total cost of $179,000, keep the 20% down payment, but I need to adjust the interest rate and the term length. Now the Atlantic article mentioned interest rates as high as 13.5%, and the John Oliver segment even mentioned rates of over 15%, but I think those are both intended to illustrate how extreme these rates can be, so in my case I'm going to be a bit more optimistic, since my partner and I both have decent credit, and go something a little bit lower. I did struggle to find an appropriate estimate. This 2021 CFPB report found median interest rates for chattel loans for manufactured homes to be 4.5% higher than mortgages for site-built homes. SoFi.com states that rates can be up to 5% higher than a standard mortgage, and Bankrate.com and AmericanFinancing.net state that rates are 1.5% higher on average, uh, though I would note that those last three don't cite sources for their figures. For my example, might be a little too optimistic, but I'm just going to split the difference and add 3% to the current 30-year fixed mortgage interest rates, which I just got from the little Google Mortgage Calculator. Uh, mortgage rates are pretty high right now anyway, so maybe that's not too far off. Assuming a 20-year loan term, that lands us with a monthly payment of $1,426. Pretty good, but obviously we're not done yet, as we haven't factored in the monthly rent for the lot space. This was a little trickier to figure out. It's not provided on the Zillow listing, so I had to do some digging. The park this home is located in is called Terra Hills Mobile Manor, which is owned by Cal Am Properties Incorporated, which has parks in Arizona, California, Florida, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington. They did not have lot rents listed for any Terra Hills properties on their website, but I was able to find the lot rents for similarly sized homes at one of their Southern California locations, and they were all $942 a month, which fits within the $825 to $975 range for Terra Hills lot rents that I found on this website, mhbo.com. Given its size, I would think the lot rent for this 3-bed, 2-bath home is probably in that $900 to $975 range. So I'm just going to guess $940 per month, which would bring us to a total monthly payment of $2,366. So that's a bit higher than what we're currently paying in rent, but if we could somehow scrape together $36,000 for a down payment, 
so it would be a better deal than we're getting right now. However, there's one last catch. This property, along with nearly all of the mobile home listings I could find on Zillow in my area, is a senior living community, meaning we, we couldn't live here unless we were at least 55 years old. I don't know the exact reasons for that for each municipality around here, but I suspect some nimbyism is at play. The idea of a multifamily development specifically for retirees is probably less likely to induce pearl clutching amongst city council members and nearby residents than a development that would serve a more general low-income population. So alas, both site-built and mobile home ownership remains outside of my reach. And what do I do when I can't have something in real life? I make it in The Sims. So here we have our little utopian mobile home park, calling it Sunset View Community Homes. It's located in Sunset Valley. It has four homes, uh, one one-bedroom, three two-bedrooms. Each has a carport and a small private yard space. There's an office building in the front and some communal spaces in the back including a pool, a hot tub, and a small playground, because this park is not age-restricted, so families with children are welcome. In our little fantasy mobile home park, Sims will not have to experience price gouging, because similar to, but more expansive than the Alameda County Mobile Home Space Rent Stabilization Ordinance, which limits space rent increases to 4% per year for occupied spaces, Sunset Valley has lot rent control laws for mobile home parks that limit annual lot rent increases and include caps on increases made during vacancies, so park owners are not disincentivized from working with residents through their financial woes rather than immediately evicting them so they can jack up the lot rent. So our sims can afford to stay in their homes for many years, giving them a chance to get to know their neighbors and build a community. So if their park owner decides it's time to sell the park and retire, the residents would likely vote to buy out the park to ensure they can preserve that community, which is something they would be given the opportunity to do because, similar to the right of first refusal laws on the books in Vermont, New Hampshire, and more recently New York and Connecticut, Sunset Valley requires park owners to provide residents a period of notice of their intention to sell the park, and if residents vote to buy out the park during that period, they then have an additional span of time to negotiate purchase, during which the owner is not allowed to accept any other offers. And lucky for our sims, Sunset Valley also has a revolving loan fund similar to the one recently established in Colorado via Senate Bill 22160, which provides financing to mobile home park residents seeking to organize and purchase their park. So with a call to the Pleasant Brothers Building and Loan, one of our fund administrators, residents of Sunset View Community Homes can start forming a co-op and secure low-interest financing to buy out their park. And then, having ownership of the land, future tenants would be able to finance their manufactured home through traditional mortgages, because, similar to legislation that has been proposed in the state of New York, Sunset Valley has laws on the books which allow buyers who intend to convert their homes from personal property to real estate by permanently affixing them to a foundation to apply for mortgages before that conversion has actually taken place. So that's the story of Sunset View Community Homes. Let's take a look at each of the units, and then I'll go over how to designate just one unit as playable if you want to download this lot from the exchange and generate NPC neighbors for the other units. First up, we have a two-bedroom home in the back of the property next to the playground. I imagine this one belonging to an older artist, primarily a sculptor, which is why we have this little artist studio in the shed in the backyard. And this person has taken in one of their siblings' teen kids, or maybe a grandkid, who would have this smaller bedroom in the front. As far as interior design goes, this one is my favorite unit. It's got a lot of rich colors and wood paneling, definitely going for a 1970s look. So I imagine this tenant has lived here the longest of anyone in the park, but they've continually made upgrades. So we've got higher end appliances in the kitchen and a nice big screen TV and whatnot. So that's the first unit. Right across from our first unit, over by the picnic area, we have another two-bedroom home. I imagine this one being for a single parent with two kids and a small dog who's really into plants and gardening and all things natural and outdoors. So there's a lot of green and florals and landscape paintings throughout the house. And then in the backyard, we've got toys for the kids and two plots for a small vegetable and herb garden, which I imagine they would share the produce from with all their neighbors. So that's our second home.
In the front, we have the first of the two smaller units, which still has two bedrooms, but I imagine it being for just one sim, so the second bedroom would be a home office. Aesthetically, this one is definitely a nod to Barbie, a lot of pink, a lot of 60s mod furniture and decor, but similar to the first unit, it's a bit retro aesthetically, especially like with the tile in the bathroom and the wallpaper in the office, but it has all newer appliances and electronics. So here's unit three. And finally, we have our only one bedroom home. This one is intended for someone who's not terribly interested in interior design, but does have two great passions, cats and whatever sport this llama merch is associated with. The inspiration for this one was a mashup of Bubbles from Trailer Park Boys, and this guy I was partnered with for my final project in programming R for analytics in grad school, who had a deeper love for the sport of cricket than I have for almost anything. I've never seen a game of cricket, but it's just nice to be around people who have big feelings about stuff. So, Abjeet, if you're out there, appreciate you man, hope you're doing well. And here's our final unit. So I've uploaded this park just as is to The Sims 3 Exchange, and the link's in the description. So you can choose which unit you want to play with and assign NPCs to the others if you download it. And here's how to do that. When you first place the lot, it will be set to a regular residential lot, not an apartment. And I would recommend just keeping it that way. In my experience, if you switch the designation to apartment, it will permanently opt you into the roommate system and generate a bunch of NPCs that are like quasi-members of your household in addition to the NPCs that live in the other units, but your like quote unquote roommate NPCs will only be able to enter your unit. So either your house will be overrun or if you lock them out, they'll be starving and passing out and soiling themselves in the communal areas. So we're gonna keep it as is. And right now the lock cost is very high because it's accounting for all of the items in every unit as well as the communal spaces. So go ahead and enter the lot in build by mode and choose the unit that you want to play with. Um, obviously you don't have to choose just one, you could always have a household with two distinct families and play with two or more of the units visible. But for our example here, I'm just going to choose the one bedroom unit in the front. You'll need to enter two cheat codes, so press shift Control c to bring up the text box and type in testing cheats enabled space true and enter. And then bring the box up again and type in by debug and enter, which will make a question mark pop up in buy mode. Navigate over to that question mark, go to the miscellaneous objects section, and search for two little spheres. The hidden room sphere and the public room sphere. You're going to take a hidden room sphere and place it in all of the rooms of the units that you don't want to play with. You can also put it in the office if you want, but I chose to keep that visible. If you want to keep it visible as well, go ahead and place a public room sphere in the office. You'll also want to put one in the gated pool area and you will need to put one on every enclosed front porch of the units that you're not going to be using. If you don't create an enclosed public space right outside of the front door of these units, the game won't allow you to generate NPCs for them. But once you have all those spheres placed, hold shift Control and click on all the front doors of those units that you're not using, and select make NPC door. Okay, now you can turn off the cheats if you want, and move your sims in. As you can see, the cost of the lot has gone down significantly because it's excluding the objects in the rooms we put those little spheres in, and now the other units are hidden, but if your neighbors are home, you can ring their doorbell, they'll come out and greet you, and they might also use the communal spaces too, like the pool, the hot tub, the playground, etc. If you decide later that you want to change which unit you'd like to play with, you're going to need to turn those cheats back on and move the spheres around. If you did set this lot up as an apartment and you're getting an error that says something about homeowners association rules, that's preventing you from editing outside your unit, you'll need to override that with the cheat restrict build by in buildings space off, and then you can make your changes. But that's about it. So to wrap things up, I did just want to talk a bit about some of my super low stakes goals for the coming year, kind of related to this video. 
I know I do tend to talk about The Sims as a form of escapism and a means of playing out a world and a life experience that I wish I could bring to reality, but you know, escapism is like candy, nice to have in moderation, but can't live off of it. So on the topic of housing, since apartment living is my past, present, and future as far as I can foresee, which I understand is a heck of a lot better situation than a lot of people out there are working with, and I hope a rising tide is on the way to lift all our boats, except maybe the yachts. One of the things I do want to focus on this year is making my place meet my needs a little better, so I'd love to hear from you all what you've done, or maybe plan on doing, to make the place where you're at right now the place where you want to be, whether that's a room, an apartment, or maybe even a mobile home. Some of the things I'm thinking of personally are figuring out how to make cleaning work for me in a way that doesn't feel like an 8 hour full body workout every few weeks. My apartment's also very dark, so I'd like to find better solutions for the rooms that don't have any overhead lighting, and maybe even replace the boob lights in the other rooms if I can find some cute secondhand fixtures, though I'm a little apprehensive about messing with electrical stuff. And then the big win would be if I could figure out an affordable laundry system that doesn't require washer dryer hookups. We do have one shared coin-op unit for our whole building, but you can't count on it because it can take a lot of calls and sometimes a couple weeks to get the property management to come empty the quarters when it gets full every month or so. So those are my things. Again, would love to hear what you guys are doing for your space or what you've accomplished already. Um, as always, appreciate you watching this video, and I wish you all a happy new year. Bye!